Hello guys and welcome back to Engineering Hack, where we try to solve engineering problems in a way that's hopefully easy to understand. Today we're introducing the angular acceleration, and the idea here is that we have this piece of equipment that has the belt center, like so, and we're trying to find out, given the acceleration on this right side, um, right hand side roll, uh, drum, trying to find out what is the magnitude of the acceleration on this left side drum. Okay, and it's a simple example. The idea is to you know introduce this concept and to based on the definition of the angular acceleration to solve this. I think you guys are going to find it quite easy. So problem statement reads: the bell tender shown is initially at rest. If the driving drum B has a constant angular acceleration of 120 radians per second squared counterclockwise, determine the magnitude of the acceleration of the belt at point C when the time is 0.5 seconds and also when the time is 2 seconds. So first things first, we are given the magnitude of the angular acceleration that we generally denote with alpha on this B here, on this drum B here. So this is how my um, the whole the whole thing is moving, right? So this whole doesn't matter the radius because this is given in radians per second squared. So whether it's here, 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 or here, they'll all be moving with the same acceleration. How does that change for this point C on this left hand side? Well, the radiuses are exactly the same, 25 and 25. So it doesn't really change much, right? Because whatever is, um, think of it this way: whenever B, whenever a point in B here moves a meter, C is going to move the same one meter, right? So for every meter that B moves, C moves one meter as well. Um, so okay, so what do we need to remind ourselves before we can solve this? We're being asked for the magnitude of the acceleration. So let me try to draw a circle here as best as I can with a given radius r, and we take any point here on this circle, and if there's a particle moving about the circle and we know that it's increasing its velocity, we know that there will be two components to this acceleration that is increasing this velocity. One component will be the tangential component and the other one will be the centripetal component. So AC and AT, let me actually put AC on this side here. And we know that if I want a magnitude of the acceleration, what I need to do is take into account both of these things. So what I need to do is consider both and take the vector that is the combination of these two components, which is going to be a vector like so according to Pythagoras, and, it's going to be, and I'm going to call that AM. So if I want to find AM, the magnitude of AM, what I need to do is apply Pythagoras, which is going to be this squared, AT squared has to be equal to A sub C squared. Okay, and that's the game plan. I want to find what is the, the both components of the acceleration, so then I can find the magnitude at time equals 0.5 and at time equals 2 seconds. What else do we need to remind ourselves? We need to remind ourselves that there's a relationship between the tangent velocity and the angular velocity which one is dependent on the other in terms of the radius, right? Because once we remove that radius component there, then we're going to get the angular velocity, which just goes back to this idea that was saying that it doesn't matter where you are in this drum B, the angular velocity and the angular acceleration will be exactly the same. Now, in terms of problem statement, we have that the bell tender is initially at rest, and that is valuable information because that means that at t equals zero, or, uh, you know, our v naught is nil, right? So v naught is zero. So if t equals zero, our v is zero both velocities because they're both related, right? So if one of them is zero, then the other one is also zero. Brilliant. What else do we want to remind ourselves? Well, we can remind ourselves of the very basics, that the tangent acceleration is just how my velocity is changing with time, that is, my tangent velocity is changing with time. Okay, so now let's just look at the units. This guy is given to us as 120 meters, oops, radians, not meters, radians per second squared. Okay, so this is just a, ra a rate at which this guy is changing. If you recall, this is radians per second. So if this is rated per second squared, this is just how this guy is changing with respect to time. So we will write that mathematically as my angular acceleration is just how my angular velocity is changing with respect to time. Right? So analogous to this fellow here, but this one is looking at the tangent one, this one is looking at the angular one. Cool. So I can relate these two, right? I can relate it to these two because if this is true over here, if this is true over here, then that means that I can, where I have my velocity, I can substitute by angular velocity times the radius. So that means that my AT has to be, so that means that my A, A sub C has to be equal to the derivative in respect to time of my angular velocity times my radius. My radius doesn't really care about time, right? Doesn't matter how much time elapses, whether this guy goes back or forth, doesn't matter. The radius here of B, and as a matter of fact, the radius of drum A as well, they're not going to change. It's going to be 25 mils regardless. So this guy doesn't, doesn't care about the derivative. It comes out and we're left with radius times the way that the angular velocity is changing with time. However, this is exactly our angular acceleration, right? So in other words, what we see here is that AT, A sub C, is the same thing as R times alpha. So let's rewrite that one more time. What we're saying here is that there's a relationship between tangent acceleration and the 
angular acceleration. So note how this, and we can, let me write this in a different form so that it's more intuitive. So the angular acceleration is also equal to the tangent acceleration divided by radius, right? So note how, note the analogy here, right, between these two guys here. Okay, it's, they're very similar, right? So the angular velocity equals the tangent velocity divided by the radius. Likewise, the angular, uh, sorry, the angular acceleration equals the tangent acceleration divided by the radius. Brilliant. So why do we do all that? Because we need to find out what is the angular, the tangent acceleration, and we need to find out what is the centripetal acceleration. For the centripetal, so we have the, the tangent one figured out. For the centripetal, we need to remind ourselves that the centripetal one is a sub c is dependent on the velocity. It's a function of the velocity. Velocity squared divided by the radius. And we've seen this in previous videos, so I'm not going to go, I'm not going to worry too much about this on this one, okay? Okay, so this is the game plan here. We're going to find out a t and a c, and with that, we can go ahead and find um, the magnitude of the acceleration, right? So the game plan is find this and find this, so then we can find this one here. Brilliant. Let's find first what is the um, a t, a sub t, okay? So, well, we're just seeing that it will be the angular acceleration times the radius, both of which we have, right? That's 120 radians per second squared times my radius that would, my radius is 25 mils, and I'm going to convert that into meters, so 25 times 10 to the minus 3. All right, so we get out of this, we get that's uh, 3, right? So 3. Uh, let me just do this one more time. So 120, 25 is the same thing as 100 divided by 4, and we have a 10 to the minus 3, so 1, 2, 3, 1, so that's 12 over 4, that's 3, yeah, 3, and that will be meters per second square, which is the unit for acceleration. It's not answered, it's not answered. This is just part of it. Now, note that, yeah, let's zoom in here. Note that this is not a function of time because our alpha, our alpha, our angular acceleration is a constant, right? It's not a function of time. It's not changing with time. It's 120 fixed in time. So if this is true, then that means that my tangent acceleration is also not a function of time. Okay? So therefore, my at is also not a function of time. So it doesn't matter what the first part A is 0.5 and part B is 2 seconds. So it doesn't really matter. The tangent acceleration is going to be the same regardless. Right? It doesn't matter how much time elapses. However, the other one, yeah, the centripetal one, we know it's a centripetal one, we know it's a function of the velocity, and the velocity is changing because we have the acceleration after all, right? So we know that this acceleration here is going to be changing our velocity, and then if my velocity is changing, then this guy here is changing. So if we want to find out the other one, we need to go. Okay, so let's change colors, and then we're going to find out centripetal velocity. I'm sorry, acceleration. To do that, we're going to need the velocity, because we know that AC equals A squared over R. And to find the velocity, we're going to use our angular velocity in our, in our relationship between the two. So what is, again, what is this? It's just how my angular velocity is changing with time. So that means that alpha ET equals the omega. And if I integrate on both sides here, as I'm going from 0 to 0.5, which is the first case, and or let's just leave it as an unknown for now, and over here I'm going from omega naught to omega. So again, we'll get there here. There's no change of alpha over time, alpha is constant, 120, so this is just alpha times time will be equal to my change in omega, so my omega minus omega naught. Omega naught, so we know, is zero because it's at rest, it says so, so that means that my omega at any given time will just be my angular acceleration times the time that has elapsed. Okay, so for the case of 0.5, if I want to find my Omega, all I need to do is 120 times 0.5, so that's just 60. And let's just make sure we're doing this. So this is radians per second squared times seconds. So this is just 60, and that will be radians per second, right? And if that's the case, then my a sub c, I need to find, oops, to find need to find b velocity. So we know that the angular velocity equals the velocity over the radius. So that means if I want my velocity, I just need to multiply my angular velocity by the radius. So that's going to be my 60 times my 25, and I'm going to write 25 as 100 over 4. Simplify my life. Okay, so 1, 2, 3 with 1, 2, 3. So that's just 3 halves of meters per second. And that's meters per second because we're multiplying radians per second by meters. So that's meters per second. So 2, 3 halves. Okay, so that means that 3 halves, 3 halves squared divided by my um, my radius, which is 25, again in meters, 10 to the minus 3, equals my centripetal acceleration. This is 9 fourths. I'm going to do again the same trick, so I'm going to multiply the 3, 
in the bottom here I'm going to have 100 and over here I'm going to have 4 so this is going to give me that 4 is that correct yep 25 4 yep so this is going to give me 90 yeah so 1 2 with this one this one this one this is 90 and that is meters per second squared brilliant so now we found that after 0.5 seconds 0.5 seconds and because we put 0.5 seconds here the um tangent velocity is three halves and my centripetal acceleration is 90 meters per second squared so what is my magnitude remember the magnitude is a component of both right so again let's just do quickly something like this and we have this guy here and my centripetal one is 90 so let's put a big factor here 90 90 meters per second squared and my tangent one is what was it that we found three so very small very small than this three meters per second squared that's how, that's what's this acceleration component looks like so what we want is we want a vector that combines both components it's going to be this one here now this one here will just be the square root of 90 squared plus 3 squared which will be something very close to 90 because um the 3 there is not contributing much right so actually we get what do get 90.05 so 90.05 that is meters per second squared and that is answer for part a let me put a over here somewhere there you go okay that's answer for part a what about part b what's going to change from a to b what will change is this value right here right so this is going to become two when this becomes two this is going to be uh, 240 if it's 240 then this will change as well when this changes as well this is going to change so this will change with this changes this changes and then therefore my magnitude of the acceleration changes as well however this one as we've seen before this one does not change with time so it doesn't really care about if it's 0.5 or 2 or uh, 100 doesn't matter it's going to be 3 regardless right so for part b so for part b my at is exactly the same it's just the 3 meters per second squared and again this is because my angular acceleration is not a function of time and my um angular velocity will just be what did we find it was um 120 times the radius oh we know we knew this already um what do we find here for the angular velocity that's uh 100 times the time there you go times the time so that's going to be 120 times 2 so this is 240 that we talked about before this is going to be radians per second and we know that if this changes this means that the velocity also changes because we know the velocity tangent velocity that is, is just this times the radius that's where the radius came in so that's 240 times the 25 times 10 to the minus 3 so almost more when you use this trick one two one two three four yeah so that's straight four that's going to be six that's six meters per second if that is six then we can go ahead to the next part which is what is my centripetal acceleration this is going to be squared my velocity divided by my radius i'm going to do one more time this, this trick so that'll be 36 times four times 100 that's going to be on four four times 100 divided by one two so and that's going to be meters per second squared brilliant so this is what changed okay note that this guy remained three regardless of the time this guy however increased greatly and if you recall the it was three against 90 over here and the three pretty much didn't have any effect so now it's three against 1440 so this time we expect even a smaller effect from the three there so this is going to be the square root of 1440 squared plus three squared we divide this sorry take the square root of this sum and this is going to be a very small very similar number to 1440 like we would expect so it's like point for the point oh oh three meters per second square so we you know we can pretty much say oh it doesn't really matter this guy pretty much doesn't really matter the magnitude of the where is our drawing here so what we're saying is you know this guy here is so big in respect to this one that the change that we get when we do the change from the green one to the red one is very small pretty much insignificant so you know it doesn't really the magnitude of the acceleration is pretty much just the magnitude of the centripetal one and that is our answer for part b okay of course you could like you could have done this problem way faster you can you know if you knew the definitions already you can say oh well i know that at equals alpha times uh, radius so I just multiply one by the radius and get the alpha straight off the bat so I get three and then I just find the um, angular velocity right off the bat calculate the centripetal one 
because there's also a relationship between the two. But I wanted to do a step by step so that we know where things are coming from as opposed to just trying to memorize the equations and all that. So I hope this was useful. If it was, uh, like this video, please. And uh, if you have any questions, leave them down below. And we'll talk soon.